jacket and my what's that my scarf and I'm gonna try to stay warm by fiery preaching but if I get cold if I I'm gonna have to I have to walk up and down right if I get cold I'm gonna put it back on okay amen We turn again to the word of the Lord this morning, and um, as you will see, I'm, I'm following a general theme. We're going to continue a little bit from last week. I've sort of catch on to the week before, and then we keep on going, and then we go uh, in, a, in another direction. Um, but still, we're going to stay in the wilderness with the children of Israel. How about that? Um, and we're going to learn more lessons from them. And... Um, Young people, be ready. I may call on you at any minute. I do that in the first service. Ready? I'm looking at you, Josh. That's right. He looks behind him to see who's behind me. <laughs> Nobody's behind you. So be ready. <laughs> but we turn to the word of the Lord this morning. And uh, as I was, uh, I was reading, and, and um, a lot of times I'll go back and look at the notes and the things that I've talked about the week before, and I'll follow up on some of the scriptures. And uh, before we change directions a little bit, look at this. Uh, look at this psalm with me. This is what we ended with last time, but we didn't have a lot of time to talk about it. Um, remember, we we talked about what God was trying to do, and Moses said, "God, I want to know you, and I want to know your ways." And it is recorded that at some point. In the 40 years of wandering in the wilderness, Moses, the man of God, it's a prayer of the man of God. It's, he writes, Lord, in the NIV it says, Lord, you have been your, our dwelling place. But I went back and I looked at some other translations, and I love the New Living Translation. Look at this. It says it in a very uh, uh, a more impactful way, doesn't it? It says, Lord, through all the generations, you have been our home. Don't you love that? You have been our home. Moses learned the lesson that the best and the highest blessings of God were not the promised land of milk and honey, but that it was God himself. It was being with God. It was in the presence of God. And we remember his prayer, Lord, if you don't go with us, don't make us go from this place. He preferred to stay in the wilderness with the Lord. And we, we see in Moses something that the children of Israel struggle to learn for 40 years. Moses learns it pretty quickly. But the children of Israel work and work and work to learn this. But God says, look at the next, uh, look at the next verse. God says early on, and this is something that Moses gets and he understands he climbs the mountain to appear before God this is Mount Sinai, Sinai or the mountain of God or Horeb we talked about this last week look at what he says the Lord called to him from the mountain and then he says tell this to the children of Israel to the to the family of Jacob look at verse 4 you have seen what I did to the Egyptians. Now look especially at this part and think about what Moses has, has prayed and then what God says. You know how I carried you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. Think about that for just a minute. Isn't that encouraging? Isn't that beautiful? In the beginning, God promised, I'm going to bring you out of Egypt and I'm going to take you to a land flowing with milk and honey, a promised land. I'm going to drive out your enemies. But God has something better for them. God has something greater for them. He says, you saw how I brought you out of Egypt and I brought you to myself. Brothers and sisters, that is what God still wants to do with you and with me. God is not just bringing us out of hardships. God is not just bringing us out of difficulties, although he does that. He does that. And I want you to, to get that this morning. This is what we're going to talk about this morning. God wants to do more than deliver you from hard places and hard things. God wants to bring you to himself. That's what, his, that's what he did for the children of Israel, his chosen people in the very beginning. And that's what he's still doing for his chosen people today, for you and for me. God is working to bring us to himself so that we get to know God, so that we understand him, and that as we are with him, we become more like him. So we talked about this last week, and I ask you again, 
Are you content with the blessings of God? Lord, answer my prayer. Lord, save me. Lord, help me. Or do you want more? Do you want the presence of God with you? Because when you have the presence of God with you, all of these other things that you and I pray for and hope for and worry about, all of these other things, they are taken care of. They are taken care of in the presence of God when He brings us to Himself. And that's what God was trying to teach His people Israel. And that is what God is trying to teach you and me as well. Amen? Amen. Amen. So, today we're going to look at, we're going to change directions just a little bit. We're going to look at, next slide, <coughs> our goals, God's purposes. We're going to see how they fit together. Our goals and God's purposes. And we're going to see there are things that fit together very well, and then there's some other things that still don't fit together. So this is what we want to, to uh, look at. And I want us to go all the way back to the very beginning of Exodus, in Exodus chapter 3. And this is when God speaks to Moses out of the burning bush. And let's look at what God says to Moses. <coughs> now, by the way, um, when we read these things, the, the attributes of God sound kind of like God... Is, it's like he's a person. I have heard and I've seen and things like that. God is God and he's everywhere. But Moses writes in this way to help us understand. And so this is what God says to Moses. I have seen, I have certainly seen the oppression of my people in Egypt. I have heard their cries of distress because of their harsh slave drivers. Yes, I am aware of their suffering. I'm aware of their suffering. Now, what were the people crying out for? It says, I've heard their cries of distress. They were crying out for deliverance, weren't they? They were crying out for help. Have you ever cried out for help or for deliverance? Oh, God, help me. I have. I have. And I've cried tears. And I've cried out loud as well. All of us have. All of us have experienced that. And God says, I've heard that. And then, verse 8, I have come down to rescue them from the power of the Egyptians and lead them out of Egypt into their own fertile and spacious land. It is a land flowing with milk and honey, and so on. And we've read part of this before, but I want you to get the picture with me this morning. So God says, I've heard them. They've been crying out in distress. And God says, so I've come to do something about it. I'm going to deliver them from the Egyptians, and I'm going to lead them into their own fertile and spacious land. As slaves in Egypt, although they had houses to live in and places, they had no land of their own. They had nothing that they could claim, this is mine. Everything they had was subject to their Egyptian taskmasters. They were at their mercy. If at any time the Egyptian taskmaster wanted something from the, from the Israelites, he took it. He took it because they were slaves. And God says, I see that, and I'm going to lead them out. I'm going to give them their own place. I'm going to give them their own land. So, here's the promise of God. Here is the goal that we see in the beginning. This is certainly what the children of Israel want, isn't it? And God says, I'm going to do for you what you're asking. So, stay with me on this. So here they are, they're crying out to God. God says, I'm going to come and answer. So in this case, we see that what God says He's going to do, and the cries of the people match perfectly. They match exactly. Surely they wanted deliverance. Surely they wanted a home of their own. They wanted safety. They wanted prosperity. They wanted freedom. And then, as God began to lead them out, Surely, they wanted to make it through the wilderness without starving, without being bitten by snakes, without being burned by the sun, and without being killed by all their enemies. They wanted to make it to the promised land. So here's what is in their hearts. Now, let's see what happens next. So here's God saying, I'm going to do this. Here are the children of Israel crying out for help. God delivers them, but God has only begun to work out His purposes for His people. 
Sometimes God answers in stages, doesn't he? Has that ever been true in your life? He begins to answer, but the whole answer is not yet there. He keeps on working. So let's see what happens next. We come to Exodus 16, and we're skipping some parts. Before Exodus 16, uh, the children of Israel have already been thirsty, and God has given them water. And then they've been thirsty in another place, and the water was bitter. And then God made the water sweet. So he's already been working with them. And then we come to Exodus 16. Now follow with me. The whole community of Israel, they set out for Elam and journeyed at, set out from Elam. Elam is where there were there, Elam was where there was good water, sweet water, fresh water. And they journeyed into the wilderness of sin, not sin like they did wrong, although they did do wrong, between Elam and Mount Sinai. They arrived there on the 15th day of the second month, one month after leaving the land of Egypt. Do you know what I have found? I used to, when I used to read uh, the book of Exodus and I used to read the Old Testament, I used to not pay a lot of attention to time. You know, you just kind of think, you know, and you keep on reading. I'm looking for action. Do you know what I have found out? Time is really important. It's really important. So follow with me on the time. One month. And so they've traveled for a month, and then look what happens next. They're between Elam, a really great place, Mount Sinai, which is where God says, I'm going to bring you there, and you're going to worship me there. They don't know, yet know what else is going to happen. They arrived there on the 15th day of the second month, okay? So now they're in their second month in the middle of the month, 15th, 15th day, that's right in the middle of the month, one month after leaving the land of Egypt. There too, the whole community of Israel complained about Moses and Aaron. Now what does that tell us? They've already been complaining, right? There too, they complained. And they complained about Moses and Aaron. Now, if you'll read Exodus, you know what you'll find out? God makes it very clear. It's not Moses and Aaron you're complaining against. You're complaining against me. That's what God says. Because he's given Moses and Aaron to lead them. Now, what is their complaint? Their complaint is the same complaint that you and I would likely have in that situation. If only the Lord had killed us back in Egypt. They moaned. Can't you, get, can't you see that? They moaned. Can't you, you know, have you ever moaned? I have. The yeah, Ami says yes. Mm -hmm. Kind of like a cow, you know. <laughs> it comes from deep and it comes up and it's moaning, it's grumbling and things like this. There we sat around pots filled with meat and ate all the bread we wanted. Selective memory, right? Very selective memory. They didn't sit around pots filled with meat and ate all the bread they wanted. They were slaves. <laughs> under, the, under the whip of slave masters. But you know, whenever we get out of tough situations, our memory always begins to change a little bit, doesn't it? And we start thinking about, well, when it was there, it was like this and it was like that. And we forget all of those things that the devil was doing in that situation. That's <coughs> We've got problems with our memories. And he says, then they say, but now you have brought us into this wilderness to starve us all to death. Wow, Moses and Aaron are terrible people, aren't they? What terrible leaders to bring them out to starve them to death. Now, follow with me and let's see what's going on here. What do they want now? Here's a, here's a new desire. What is their new desire? What is their new goal? We don't want to starve, right? We want to have enough to eat. And so they begin grumbling and moaning and complaining. The problem is, and I want you to get the picture this morning because this is a picture of us. They don't see the big picture. They have already forgotten that God brought them out of Egypt. And they don't yet see what God is going to do for them in the promised land. The only thing they can see is their trouble at that moment. The only thing they can see is their difficulty at that moment. Now follow with me, because this is a picture of you and me. What happens next? They moan. They don't even pray and say, oh God, give us food. They just complain, which is what we do sometimes as well, right? Now, let's look at what happens next. By the way, whether you say it out loud or not, God hears you, okay? If it's moaning, if it's grumbling, if it's inside, whatever, God hears it. Now let's see what God says. Next, uh, next slide. 
Then we go a little bit further. Then the Lord said to Moses, he hears them. If you read verses 1 through 3, you will see that uh, God says, I have heard them complaining. And at later he says, they're complaining about me. They're not complaining about you. And then the Lord said to Moses, look, I'm going to rain down food from heaven for you. Each day the people can go out, pick up as much food as they need for that day. Ah, now follow follow. What comes next? I will what? Mm-hmm. You see where we're going this morning, don't you? I will test them in this to see whether or not they will follow my instructions. Aha. Go a little bit further. So Moses and Aaron said to all the people, by evening you will realize it was the Lord who brought you out of the land of Egypt. Go a little bit further. Then the Lord said to Moses, I have heard their complaints. Now tell them, in the evening you'll have meat to eat. In the morning you'll have all the bread you want. Then you will know that I am the Lord your God. Now, we're going to keep this up here. Follow with me. Because what we see in these few verses speaks so much to you and to me this morning. God hears their complaint. complaint and He says, I'm going to meet your need. That evening, what happens? What birds fly in? What birds? Quail. Quail. Quail come in. God used a natural phenomenon to feed His people. God can do that. They were migratory birds. They were flying from Europe. You say Europe? What we call Europe today. They landed there and then they would go on probably to parts of northern Africa probably, what we call Northern Africa today. And that was, where they, that was where they landed in the evening because they'd traveled, they'd flown a long distance. The birds were too tired to fly once they landed. That's, I mean, that's, that's what they found. They were too tired to fly, so they were on the, they landed in the ground. And historical records, archaeological records, even show Egyptians and others with hand nets grabbing birds, grabbing quail. So that's something that God used for His people, to feed His people. So quail comes at night, but in the morning, something happens that has nothing to do with a natural phenomenon. God sends manna. And you will find, if you go through the Bible, you will find that God doesn't call it manna. Manna is what the people call it. Do you know why they call it manna? Do you know what it was called manna? In Hebrew, manha meant, what is that? That's, what it, that's the Hebrew expression for what is that? And so, so that's what they called the food. They called it manna because it came from the Hebrew manna. What is that? And so in the morning, manna comes. Now, I want you to look at something with me. God's miraculous provision not only meets their immediate need. I want you to see that with me this morning. Look carefully here. God's doing a lot of things right here. He says, I'm going to rain down food from heaven. But I want you to look at this. First of all, he's going to test them. But then I want you to look at verse 6 and verse 11. God is doing something else. He's not just meeting their need. He's not just providing for them. God wants them to know who He is. Do you see that? God wants them to know who He is. Moses and Aaron say, Then you will realize it was the Lord who brought you out of the land of Egypt. And then God says a little bit later, when I have done this, then you will know that I am the Lord your God. You're going to know that I'm the Lord your God. I want you to see something, brothers and sisters, this morning. If you haven't seen it before, God has no problem answering your prayers. God has no problem meeting your needs. God has no problem doing a miracle for you and for me. That is so easy for God. It's the easiest thing in the world. But God wants to do something more in your life. God wants to do something more in your situation. What does God want to do in this situation? Here's a lesson for us. God wants His people to know, I am God. I am God. God is working in such a way, not just to answer their prayer and meet their needs. God is working so that they will know who He is. Who He is so that they'll know, oh, you are God. This is who you are. Now, does this remind you of anybody? 
It reminds me of Moses. Look at the next verse. Remember what Moses said to God in Exodus 30, uh, 33, 13? Next slide. Remember what Moses prayed? He says, if it's true that you look favorably on me, let me know your ways so my, I may understand you more fully and continue to enjoy your favor. By the way, it's just after here that Moses says, if you don't go with us, don't make us leave this place. Moses has been talking to God and he says, okay, if you're, who's going to lead us? You're going to take us up there. But in the midst of all of that, Moses has a bigger issue. Moses has something on his heart that is more important than, oh God, answer our our prayer. Oh God, meet our needs. Oh God, do something for me. The prayer of Moses and the heart of Moses and what is in his heart and what's burning on him, the first priority of Moses is, God, I want to know you. Lord, I want to understand you. Let me know your ways so I may understand you more fully. Not just, oh God, answer my prayer. Oh God, meet my need. Moses understood that about God. Brothers and sisters, I can see you're a little bit sleepy this morning. That's okay. Shake yourself if you need to. Shake yourself. This is good for us this morning. This is the Word of God for us. I know this is God's message for us. We so often, we do, we so often, we pray for help, don't we? We pray for help. God help me. God help me. God help me. And it's okay. We, God, God hears our prayer. God cares about you. Remember how all of this began? God said to Moses, I've heard the cry of my people and I've come down to help them. There's no problem with that. But don't stay there. Don't stop with that. God wants to do more than work a miracle for you. God wants to do more than answer your prayer. God wants you to know in your heart of hearts. God wants you to experience that He is God. Because when you see God, when you know God, when you experience God in your situation and in your presence, that's when your needs are really met. That's when things change. That's when you are transformed. That's when your situation is transformed. When you know that He is God. When you know that He is God. And that's what He's trying to do. It's easy, easy, easy for God to work a miracle for His people. It is another matter entirely for God's people to know Him and to experience Him. And that's what God wants. And so you see, God is not only providing. Back up just a minute to the pre previous slide. Just a minute. Uh, Go back to there. God is not only providing, God is proving. Because God has to work on our hearts, doesn't He? He has to work on our hearts. So God says, I'm going to take care of them. But then, as He provides, He also proves. He says, I will test them in this to see whether or not they will follow my instructions. Aha! Okay, brothers and sisters, put yourself in with the children of Israel this morning. God says, I'm going to provide, but as I provide, I'm going to test. I'm going to provide and I'm going to prove. Let me ask you something this morning. If God would do that for the children of Israel and deal with them in that way, do you think it is possible that God will deal with you and me in the same way? Yes or no? Yes. 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 We're going to look at this a little bit further. Now let's go ahead to slide seven. Okay? So next slide and then the next slide up we see. Okay, keep going. One more slide. Here we go. Here's what Moses says. The manna comes. They ask about it. Moses says, it's the food that the Lord has given you to eat. Now, look at what happens next. Are these instructions specific? Each household gather as much as it needs. Pick up two quarts for each person in your, te in your tent. Now some of you are saying, quart, quart, what's a quart? I'm American so I know exactly what two quarts is. Um, two quarts is a little bit less than two liters. Okay, so you, you, get, you can get an idea about how much it is. So here was this special food from God, two quarts of it for one person, and it would be enough to give them, it was enough calories for one day. It was all exactly what they needed. Exactly. It was really special food, wasn't it? God knew exactly what they needed. God gave them exactly what they needed. So two quarts would feed one person, except for Nat Nat because he can really eat. So maybe Nat Nat would need three quarts. I don't know. No, you know what? The Bible's really special. The Bible says 
what they gathered, gather this much, and it would provide. I don't know how God did that, but it was exactly right for each person. And so he gives very, very specific instructions. Verse 17, they did as they were told. And then Moses told them, do not keep any of it until morning. Mm-hmm. Okay? Don't keep any of it. Verse 20, but some of them, what? They didn't listen, and they kept some of it till morning. What happened the next morning? By then, oh, it was full of maggots and had a terrible smell. Have you ever smelled something? Have you ever smelled rotten food before? Yes. Oh, it's so terrible, isn't it? It's so. For me, I was thinking about that. I, I love the Bible because it's so descriptive. I think about rotten food sometimes. Every once in a while, I will smell something in my house, and I'm very clean. But sometimes I'll buy vegetables and I'll put them in a basket and I keep them there and I just forget to cook them. You know, for example, some of you say you forget. Yes, I forget. Um, I buy potatoes. I love potatoes. I love potatoes. And I'll put them in my basket because I don't put them in the refrigerator. Have you ever forgotten a potato in your house? Yes. And it got rotten? How terrible was it? It's terrible. It's so terrible. Or even worse, a tomato. Yeah. <laughs> All of you are saying yes. Can you imagine how awful that was? But it takes a long time, doesn't it? It takes maybe two weeks, two and a half weeks, and then you start, <laughs> you start smelling something, and by the time you pick it up, it's liquid already, right? It's so, so terrible. Now, if the Bible says it had a terrible smell, can you imagine what it smelled like? Really? Overnight, that fast, and it was full of maggots. Oh, so awful, so terrible. Why do you think that happened? Why do you think it, there were maggots and there was such a terrible smell? I think that's kind of supernatural too. Don't you think so? I really do. I think that was God doing something there. I really do. It doesn't take 24 hours for it to completely get rotten and maggots to start. But God was trying to teach his people something, wasn't he? Moses was very angry with them. Verse 21, after this, the people gathered the food morning by morning. Now, stop with me and think about this just a minute. What is God doing here and what is God trying to teach them? What is God trying to teach them? God is trying to teach them obedience, isn't he? God's trying to teach them obedience. And I want you to pay careful attention to this because God is doing something special here and it's something that he wants us to learn as well. God gives them very specific instructions. It seems like God is awfully picky. D doesn't it seem that way? Pick two quarts. Go out every morning except on the Sabbath. On the Sabbath, the day before, you get double and then you'll have enough on that day. And God says, go out and pick it. Don't save it overnight. Now, I don't know about you, but here's, here's Jennifer. What I would want to do is, I would want to get up early one morning, gather double, and then the next morning, I would sleep in. And I wouldn't get up and gather manna. Is that what you would do? Of course that's what you would do. And that's what the children of Israel did too. That's why some of them went out and that's why it was stinky the next morning. Because they thought just like we do. They're people just like we are. But God said, I don't want you to do it that way. I want you to go out every morning. Why does God say that? Think about that. Why? Why can't they just gather enough at the beginning of the week and have it all week long? God is doing something. God is doing something. So keep thinking about it. So. Do some of them fail the first manna test? Yes or no? Yes. They fail the first manna test. Remember, God is providing, but He's proving as well. He's proving. He wants to show what's in their hearts. Does God know what's in their hearts? Yes. yes. Do they know what's in their hearts? Yes. No. No, most of the time, no. Unless we're really wicked. A lot of times we think, I'm so good, I'm so obedient, I'm such a good Christian, I worship the Lord, I praise His name in church, but that is not the measure of our hearts. That's not the proving of our hearts. What we see here is what is true in our own hearts as well and in our own situations. The proving of your heart and the proving of my heart comes in day Today, obedience to God's ways, day to day. And God uses the daily things of our lives, the daily things. Young people, 
this morning, I want to say something to you. Let me speak really frankly. We've got quite a few young people here this morning. Do you know that God proves your heart day by day in your home? You know, sometimes when you don't want to do what your parents say and you want to talk back to you this or that, or your parents say, I want you to do this and do it now, and you grumble or complain. I want to tell you something. And, and, I, and the reason I'm saying that is because hard to believe I was a young person one time as well. Many, 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 many years ago. And I know what it's like. I know what it's like. But what I want to say to you is this. God's proving your heart. He is. He's proving your heart in that situation. In that situation. Others of us, God's proving us in other areas and in other ways. But God takes the daily things of your life, listen, and He takes the daily things of my life and He proves the, our hearts for eternal things. So He takes daily things to prove eternal things in our hearts and in our lives. And so they fail, some of them fail, the manna test. Does He give them another chance? Yes, He does. Let's look at the next one. Exodus 16, 22 through 27. On the sixth day, they gathered twice as much as usual, and then all the leaders of the community came, and they asked Moses for an explanation. Moses had told them, now God said, on the sixth day, instead of two quarts, gather four quarts. And of course, all the people are saying, but four quarts, it's going to get stinky. And they're going to be maggots. Are you sure? And so Moses explains. Listen, listen, look carefully here. He told them, this is what the Lord has commanded. Tomorrow will be a day of complete rest, a holy Sabbath day set apart for the Lord. So bake or boil as much as you want today. Set aside what is left for tomorrow. So they put some aside until morning, just as Moses commanded. And in the morning, the leftover food was stinky and full of maggots. No. no. What does it say? Wholesome and good without maggots and odor. And now, look with me. Mm, 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 mm. Verse 27. Some of the people went out anyway on the seventh day. How many of you would have gone out on the seventh day anyway? Maybe. Yeah. Maybe. They went out anyway. And what happens? But they found no food. But they found no no food. Okay? Now, I want you to think with me about that. So God gives them another chance. And He says, on the sixth day, gather twice as much. On the seventh day, there won't be any food out there. Now, I want you to think with me for just a minute. Why does God do this? Is God being picky? Is God like a puppet master saying, jump! Jump this way! Jump that way! We sometimes think God is like that, don't we? God gives us instructions. God gives us guidelines. And we don't want to do it or we think this way or we that way. That's not what God is doing at all. God wants to teach them something. And I want, to see it, and I want us to see that this morning. Brothers and sisters, when God gives you instructions, when God gives you guidelines, He has a reason for it. God's not trying to be arbitrary with you. God's not, not trying to say, you know, you know what our parents... Young people again, sometimes our parents tell us to do something and we say, why? Do you ever say why? <laughs> why? Of course we do. And you know what our parents say? Because I said so. <laughs> That's right. And Pastor Renee started to say, some of our parents say, because I said so. Now your parents have reasons for doing that, but sometimes we're that way with God, aren't we? And we say, why? And God says, it's for your own good. It's for your own good. And I want us to see something here. So they go out. Moses has told them the day is to be a day of complete rest. It's to be a day of complete rest. Look at the next slide. Then the Lord asked Moses, How long will these people refuse to obey my commands and instructions. How long will they refuse to obey my command and my instructions? Look with me at verse 29. And here, this tells us something about the heart of God. They must realize that the Sabbath is the Lord's gift to you. That is why He gives you a two-day supply on the sixth day. So there will be enough for two days. On the Sabbath day, you must each stay in your place. Do not go out to pick up food on the seventh day. Now I want us to see something here this morning, brothers and sisters. God gives them instructions. Some of the people disobey and they go out and look anyhow 
and they're hungry because there's no food and they can't go to their neighbors and get extra food. Why? Because each person has to gather enough for himself. And there are all sorts of principles here. And God says, the Sabbath day is my gift to you. It's a day of rest. What is God trying to tell His people? What is God trying to show His people? And what is God trying to show you and me? First of all, God was trying to show the children of Israel this. God was trying to show them, I will take care of you. I will feed you every day. Your provision is a miracle from me. Everything you receive is governed by my word because the manna came and was given at the word of God. It was given at the word of God. It wasn't just a natural phenomenon. Oh, here comes manna. It wasn't just, okay, manna every day, autopilot. It came from the word of God. It came from the word of God and it came every day. Why did it come every day except the Sabbath day? Remember what Jesus said later? I am the bread that has come down out of heaven. And then he said, man does not live by bread alone, but what? By every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. That's the manna. And God wanted them to understand, children of Israel, manna is not your provision. I am your provision. What I give you is not what gives you life. I give you life. I am your life. It's not manna that comes every day. And then when it came to the seventh day, he wanted them to understand something else. On the seventh day, no manna comes. No manna comes. Well, I don't understand. I don't understand. I've got to go work. I've got to go get manna. But God wanted them to understand something. God wanted them to understand your provision and your food does not come from your own hands. When you go out there and you pick it up, it will be easy to think, I did it. These hands picked up the food that I needed. I'm out there working. I'm providing for myself. And God says to his people then, and God says to us now, there's a day of rest. There's a time of rest because I will provide for you. Listen, brothers and sisters, let me, let me apply it into the 21st century here in Hong Kong. All of you know, and this, 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 this is at every level, at every level. If you are working this morning, if you are working in Hong Kong, then you know the pressure of work, don't you? It's work all the time. It's work all the time. And you can look in Central and you can look in other places. There are people that work seven days a week, don't they? They never stop. They work, they work, they work. And even for us, there's the pressure to work, isn't there? There's the pressure to work. And there's the pressure of, I have to do this. I have to do this. I have to provide. I have to provide for my, for my family. I have to get this done. Now let me say something else. Those of you that are not yet working, but maybe you're students, so I'm talking to the young people here this morning, you know the same thing. Hong Kong is so competitive scholastically, isn't it? It's so competitive scholastically. You're always under pressure. Work, work, work. Homework, homework, homework. Get ahead, get ahead, get ahead. And there's the pressure to, you need to be studying all the time. You need to be studying all the time. You can't take a break. You've got to study or else you'll get behind. What I want to say to you this morning is this. God says to his people, if you're a young person here this morning and it has to do with studying, if you're working here today, God says to you and to me, your provision for your family and for yourself in your work will not come from all the work that you can do seven days a week, 24 hours a day. If you are a student here this morning, God says the same thing to you. It doesn't mean you can be lazy. It doesn't mean you can neglect your studies. But I want to say this. If in your thinking, I got to study, I got to study, I got to study, because I've got to get, I've got to get good grades. I understand that. I wanted to get good grades too. I wanted straight A's. I, I worked for straight A's. I understand that. But what I want to say is this. All the brains in your head, all the brains in your head, 
are not enough to get you to the top of the class, to get you ahead. You are God's child. You say, well, I'm just a teenager. You're God's child. God cares about you. And God says to you this morning, and God says to us this morning that are part of the work world, trust me to provide for your life. Trust me. Oh, beloved, beloved, listen to the words of God this morning. God wants to take that burden off of your shoulders. God wants to take that load off of you. God wants to lift the worry. How many of you worry about providing for your families and for your future? How many of you? You worry sometimes. You're concerned. Okay, that's right. We're worried. You're good parents and you're thinking about yourselves and you're thinking, believe me, brothers and sisters, I think about myself sometimes. I have no children and I will outlive my cat so I don't have to worry. <laughs> I don't have to worry about an inheritance for Lucy. She, she won't be around much longer. My parents, should Jesus tarry, my parents will be gone before, before, I, before I go. I have no kids to provide for. But I'll be really honest with you, and I'm speaking very frankly. I look at my income. I'm not complaining. I'm so satisfied. I'm so thankful for what God has allowed me to do. But I look at my income, and I look at what I have saved, and I look at America because that's where I'm from. I'll tell you right now, if I think about it too much and look at my bank account too much, I couldn't sleep at night. Because I, I'm serious. You know why? I don't have enough to live on. I don't. I'll be in the, as we say in America, I'll be in the poor house in America should I, should I reach, reach the age of 80 somewhere. The government will have to take care of me because I won't be, able to take, won't, be, won't be able to take care of myself. And if I think about it too much, I really start to worry. And I think, what, what should I do? I need to do this. I need, maybe, maybe I can get kind of part-time on the side or, or this or that or, or something like that. And the Lord has had to deal with me in this area as well. Why? Because I'm following Him and I'm obeying Him. So here's the challenge to you and to me, because God is providing, but He's also proving our hearts. He's proving our hearts, and God is proving our hearts. Are you following Him, and are you obeying Him? Are you in His will? Are you in His will, yes or no? Yes. If you're not in His will, then you're in a place of danger. You're in a place of danger. But when you're in God's will, and you're doing what God has called you to do, he will provide for you. He will provide for you. And that's when I have to settle myself, just like the children of Israel. I can't be lazy and say, oh, I'll get enough this morning and tomorrow morning I won't have to go out. There's work for me to do. You understand what I'm saying? But there's also rest for me in the will of God and in the provision of God. And God is proving our hearts to see if we will trust Him to see if we will obey Him, to see if we will receive His gracious gifts of rest. So I want to challenge you this morning in a very practical way, whether you're a student here this morning or you're working here this morning, to trust God to provide for you. Don't let the world around you squeeze you into its mold. I challenge you, take a day of rest. I challenge you, take time apart. That's why on Mondays, I sometimes, I turn off my phone. I do. I turn off my phone. I sleep in. I do this and that. I have to have a day of rest to wait on the Lord, to be restored. If you're a student, I challenge you. Be diligent all the other time you have. And then I challenge you, take a day. You say, oh, no, 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 sorry, Pastor. I've got a test tomorrow morning. I've got to study this afternoon. I've got to study tonight. I challenge you, take a day of rest and prove God and see if God, don't be lazy, don't be lazy. Do your studying Saturday, Friday, all the other days. Do your work all the other days. I challenge you to prove God in this way. Prove God in this way. I want to say one other thing and then we're going to stop this morning. We're going to look at one other thing. You see, God is proving our hearts, brothers and sisters. He's seeing if we're going to obey Him. You know why He's, saying, you know why he's doing that? Because God 
wants us to know what he's like. God is not a God of, of burdens. God is not a God who pushes you. God is a God who will give you rest in your work. Now I want us to look at one other scripture. Look at the next one, Exodus 16, 1. They set out for Elam. They journeyed into the wilderness of sin between Elam and Mount Sinai. They arrived there on the 15th day of the second month, one month after leaving the land of Egypt. This is still part of what we're talking about. Look at this. Now, look at the next verse. A few verses later, exactly two months. So here we are, a month and a half. Here we are, two months. Two months after exactly they left Egypt. Remember I told you timing is important. They arrived in the wilderness of Sinai and they came to the base of the mountain. They came to the mountain of God. Now, here's where the timing of God is so important. Two weeks earlier, God tests them with manna. Yes? He tests them with manna. And he says, I'm going to test them and see if they will obey me in this. What happens two weeks later? They come to the mountain of God. They come to Sinai. What happens at the mountain of God? What happens at Sinai? The Ten Commandments. The law of God. So two weeks before, God gives them a small test. Will you obey me? Because he knows Two weeks later, he's going to give them the laws that will fully govern their lives. Everything. It will fully govern how they live and what they do. The, every part of their life. But God is preparing for them for that. And so God gives them a manna test two weeks earlier. And a bunch of them fail it. And he's trying to prepare them so that they will know he is God. And he's trying to work in their hearts because two weeks later, another test is coming and an, uh, something that's much, much bigger is coming their way. It's the Ten Commandments. It's all the law that he gives them. And God says, I've got to work in their hearts now. I want them to obey now. Because God knows if he can get his people to obey in the small areas, it's going to be much easier for them to obey in the big areas. Listen, brothers and sisters, now put yourself in that as we come to a close this morning. I meet so many Christians, and I struggle with this myself. I struggle this with this myself. Oh, we will obey God in the big things. How many of you, how many of you do that? God has some important commands, right? The big things, I will obey God. But the little things... The gossip, the grumbling, the grudge in their heart. Nobody's looking. All of these little things, those don't really matter. Those don't really count. But now the big things, I would never do that. That's against God's laws. And that's how a lot of Christians are. And that's how we are as well. That's how we are as well. And God is working in our hearts. And God is proving us. He's proving us in small things so that our hearts might learn to obey now. And as we come to the bigger things, that there will be a pathway and a path pattern of obedience in our lives that he might bless our lives and that he might give us life and that we might come to know him. I'll tell you something. If we are unwilling to obey God in the small things, in the small things, it is unlikely we're going to obey him in bigger things. It's unlikely. I was praying about this yesterday. And as I was praying, I'm not going to tell you what it is because it was between God and me. But you know, I always try to be really honest with you. I hope you don't think, oh, she sure is a terrible pastor. She's always telling us about these struggles that she has. But pastors struggle too. I was praying about something. And as I was praying, a little thought. The Lord brought something to mind that's part of my life. And I said, yeah, Lord. And I kept on praying about other things. I was praying for the sermon, and I was praying about other things. And last night when I came back, I was praying again, and shoo, the Lord brought it to mind again. And, and I realized the Lord wanted to deal with that in my life. 
And it was, it's a small thing. It's not a big thing. But you know what? I haven't been obedient in that area. It's, it's really small. It, I mean, it's really small. But you know what? When I tell myself it's really small and God says something about it, then you know what? It's not that small. It's not that small. It's not small to God. Why? Because God is proving my heart. He's proving my heart. And He's proving your heart. And brothers and sisters, He will take the day-to-day -day things of your life. Guys, young people, in school, things that happen. God's proving your heart. Something comes out, God's proving your heart. But He's going to give you another chance. He's going to give you another chance. Just like He gave them a chance. Those of us who are adults and are working, God's proving our hearts. And He's going to give us another chance. But God wants us to walk in obedience that He might bless our lives. Amen? Amen. Amen. Now, I know you were a little bit sleepy this morning. I could tell it. But take it into your hearts. Pray about it. And let the Lord deal with your hearts. And mine too. And mine too. Let's pray. Amen. Lord, here we are. As I pray for you, would you pray for your... I've already prayed for myself, so I'm going to pray for you now, okay? You pray for yourself right now. And parents, pray for your kids too. Lord, here we are this morning, and we've heard about these stubborn, stubborn, stubborn children of Israel. And Lord, we just think, oh God, why didn't they listen to you? Lord, I would have gone out and gotten the manna just like you told me to. But Lord, we're, we're really fooling ourselves because so many times we would do exactly as they did. We, we wouldn't have been very obedient either. But Lord, I pray that you would work in our hearts and you would work in our lives. That you would work out and bring obedience in our hearts. Bring obedience in our lives. That we might walk in your ways. That we might know you. That Lord, when you... When you provide for us in these tough areas of our lives, that you're proving our hearts and that we would, Lord, that we would pass the test. We want to pass the manna test in our lives, Lord. We really do. Lord, we don't want to sweep some small things under the rug and say, well, those are small things. God, I'll obey you in the big things. But Lord, help us to obey you in the small things, in the medium things, in the big things. Lord, I pray right now also for the young people who are sitting here right now that are struggling with the pressure of their studies at school day after day after day the pressure to study to study to study to study God I pray that they would do their best and then begin to learn to trust you to help them to trust you Lord that you've given them their brains that you've given them their ability and that when they've done their best Lord you're going to take their best and you're going to do something with it Lord I, Lord prove yourself God prove yourself to the young people of the church prove yourself to them and Lord, I pray for everybody else here now who's struggling with the workload of Hong Kong and the worry of providing. Oh God, help us to trust you that it's not by the strength of our own arm and our hands and all that we can do and the hours that we can work, but Lord, that as we do what we've been called to do, we can trust you to provide for us, for our families, and for our futures. We thank you, Lord. Help us to trust you and to walk in your ways. Help us to learn about you and to know your ways and not just your blessings. In the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. 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 God bless you. <laughs>